Welcome back to Morning at NTV and thank you for staying with us right here. My name is Romeo Busiku. Our next conversation is centered around the COVID-19 pandemic and I do have Dr. Kiza Besije who is going to be sharing with us a lot more. But let me give you a preamble that can take us into this conversation. Yesterday, as the nation waited for President Yuri Museveni, my next guest went to Twitter to question the president's lack of clarity over some issues. And today we sought out a former presidential candidate, that is uh, the retired Colonel Dr. Kiza Besije, to share with us some of his views on how best we can, you know, revive the economy after the lockdown. How can we live with COVID-19? as a COVID-19 vaccine is being actualized and how, what are his plans uh, for 2021 as we move forward. He joins me right now on set right here at his residence in Kasangati. A very good morning, Dr. Kizabesige. Very good morning to you and uh, a good morning to all the NTV viewers, wherever you are viewing us from. Mm -hmm. First of all, let's talk about the COVID-19 pandemic and how government has actually performed. In your assessment and your opinion, how has government actually, you know, performed and how has it handled the COVID-19 lockdown? Are there any positives or negatives? Well, I think, uh, as uh, we have been saying, because now it's already more than two months uh, with this uh, issue of COVID. And uh, uh, one of the things that uh, I think there is no controversy has been on the question of the measures to reduce the spread of, uh, of COVID. Mm. Now, these measures, uh, you know, were again established way back from the time this uh, pandemic began. World Health Organization rolled out the kinds of measures that will help countries to deal with this uh, spread. However, countries have responded to those kinds of recommendations differently. I would go with the recommendations as rolled out by World Health Organization, which Uganda has implemented. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think which have uh, helped in indeed, as expected, containing the spread of the virus. Mm -hmm. uh, I must say that um, I think within Africa, we are still lucky and we should be extremely grateful to God, because this is not of our own making, that even in areas where there has been no implementation of those measures, we haven't seen the kind of scenes that we saw in, uh, in countries that have been very, very badly hit. Uh, that still needs to be uh, studied as to what is uh, generally reducing on uh, influencing the uh, s rather slow pace of spread within the African region. South Africa, we have a, a little more problem than in er elsewhere. Mm. But generally in Africa, even in countries, as I have said, you know, there has been a campaign in Burundi mm. with the people congregating and doing all kinds of things and uh, uh, no lockdown, and, uh, and we haven't seen the kinds of scenes that we have seen elsewhere. Mm. So I think there is another element beyond the measures that we have taken that may be responsible for the kind of results that we have. Mm -hmm. nonetheless, mm -hmm. nonetheless, I entirely agree with the measures that have been taken to reduce the spread of this pandemic. In fact, I was critical about the late implementation of those measures mm. because, again, we were, we, we were not frontline uh, in, uh, in this situation. Mm. It came here, you know, I think about three months after it, it had been rampaging elsewhere. Mm. So for us, I think we, would, we could have acted a little earlier mm -hmm. than we even acted. Having said that, these measures that we put, as I have indicated, mm. are to slow the spread. Mm. But so what happens? Mm. People cannot stay under those restrictions. Indeed. So you have to plan. This, the restrictions are to buy you time mm. to do things that will sustain you uh, for the longer run. Mm. 
And that is where I have very fundamental problems with how we have responded to this problem. Mm -hmm. Because those indeed should have been uh, planned for, and we had enough time to plan. Uh, the, the world emergency was declared in January. Uh, we did not get a case here until mid-March, you know. So uh, we had time to plan what to do right from the word go up to the end. Let us know what government should have done. So the first thing mm. is, you know, and I have been talking about a six-point plan. The yes. first one is dealing with the healthcare system. The preparedness of a healthcare system to deal with the large numbers of sick patients and some seriously sick. Mm. And this situation we can still have. We are, we are not out of the woods. Mm. We can still have very many patients quickly and some who need serious uh, intensive care, intensive management. So we would have had a plan that shows us where we are and where we need to quickly go mm -hmm. to manage this kind of a pandemic. And where we were is extremely worrying mm -hmm. because we have not invested in healthcare mm -hmm. seriously for a very long time. So how best can this government better position itself to actually tackle this pandemic? We are talking about the ongoing pandemic. Yes. We are also talking about after yes, the yes, effects. Yes, mm. yes, yes. We, we are talking mm. about the pandemic that is going to last for quite some time. Indeed. This pandemic before a treatment, is, before cure is found, mm. before vaccine is found, we will have to live with it in the kind of way that we are doing now. So how can we best position ourselves? So this is what I'm saying, that mm. we would have had a plan first, Mm. to develop the health care system. Indeed. Up to today, I frankly don't know the plan to rave up the health care system in terms of numbers of health care workers, mm. mobilization of health care workers. We have a very minuscule health care, uh, you know, staff. Uh, doctors, the establishment of government mm. is about, you know, about 1,200 doctors, and that is about 60% field. Mm. So that puts a doctor, if it was full, a government doctor, to about 34,000 citizens, compared to what the optimum would be to about 1,000 per doctor. So we would have had a plan to say, now that this problem has come, mm -hmm. let's see how we scale up the staffing, mm -hmm. doctors, nurses, paramedics. So we would be knowing now by by the time of the end of the lockdown, mm. we are at this level. Then the hospital beds. Mm. I was shocked to listen to, 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 to read in Mr. Museveni's speech that now we have prepared 3,200 beds for COVID if there is a problem. 3,200 beds, come on, this is, a, this is a joke. For 40 million people, you can quickly get uh, hundreds of thousands of people that need hospitalization. And then you are saying, maybe if that happens, we shall put up tented uh, hospitals. Where is the plan for that? Where is the budget for that? So we need the plan. That plan for healthcare development is the one that has not been there. Mm. Secondly, uh, uh, after that, that, that kind of a plan, mm. you need the plan of how to quickly improve the, uh, the immunity of Ugandans. Because apart from the healthcare which defends people, People must defend themselves. Indeed. What is the plan for raving up the immunity of citizens? I haven't seen anything in this at mm. all. In fact, everything has been done to push down the immunity of citizens. Everything that pushes down the immunity of citizens is what we've seen. Mm. You know, nutrition, people are starving and, uh, and, 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 and hungry all over the, the place. Stress. But even the food that is being distributed is not food that will push up their immunity. We have not paid any attention to that. You know, the stress uh, of, of bills, we have not even cared to deal with the rent that people are not earning. They, they, are, they should not be under threat of eviction. How are we dealing with the rent? It was talked about casually that, you know, people should not be evicted. But if you are still charging rent or tax, landlords are still 
encumbered to pay tax on, the, on those houses people are renting. The banks are still on their necks. There has not been any easing of loan terms and so on, which would start with the bank of you. How do you expect? So we have not looked at how to deal with uh, and have programs on the radios. Mm -hmm. The only programs have been wash your hands, I don't know, you know, cough hygienically. That's fine. Mm -hmm. That was the first phase. Mm -hmm. But the second thing is the plan for everybody. Mm -hmm. And we are again starting at a very low level where we have, you know, 50% of women in childbearing age are anemic. 50%, one out of every two. Let, let, me, get we this, have, let me get this straight, Doctor. Yes. You're saying that... Um, the government, since time immemorial, at least since the COVID-19 uh, pandemic made its way to Uganda, has been focusing on stopping the spread of the virus so that people don't get infected. But then you're saying what government should be focusing on is alleviating the effects of the pandemic. Am I right? Uh, manage, that is all the response. This is the response mm. to the pandemic. Mm. Because the idea is that the, the, the COVID should not destroy us, mm. should not kill us. Ha, and what is the plan? So the first one is the health care system. Mm. The second one is the human beings, yes, preparing yes. the human mm. beings. Which hasn't been done. Which, has, which I don't see. We, we are not even educating, forget about providing what is needed mm. to improve the, uh, but just to educate them, mm. you know, to provide counselors. We in the people's government, indeed, because of those plans, have been trying to, uh, to mitigate in this situation. Mm. So we put up, a, for example, desks of counselor, of counselors. And, and we have been advertising telephone numbers. If you are stressed and, uh, you know, you think everything has closed in on you, call this number, talk to our person. They'll give you advice. They'll, they'll assist you on how to manage, you know. These are things that should be there in all districts. That's why we are dealing with even domestic violence that is un, un, unprecedented. There should be social workers who are working on this, who should have also been stepped up. How many social workers do we have in the country? This is a situation that needs a lot of social workers and an infrastructure for them to function and, 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 and media access and so on. There was no plan to deal with that. Up to now, I don't see any plan to deal with improvement of the, of the, of, of the person that, and, is, and meeting, that, is, that mm. is meeting COVID. Mm. The third thing that we would have to have a plan for is research on how the spread is going. Mm. You know, surveillance. Again, right from the word go, surveillance within the community. Surveillance in especially exposed areas, those who are at greater risk. Even as we talk today, healthcare workers have not been tested. Mm. <laughs> Even as we talk, who are the most Vulnerable, Indeed. you know, uh, so we would need to have a test for the community and a plan, mm. a plan right from the word go. I had, again, I read in, the, in, the, in, the, in Mr. Museveni's speech mm. that um, so far we have done community tests, 16,000, mm. all this time, just 16,000. Now that, it's still something. You know, some countries haven't gotten to that, like South Sudan, uh, which is uh, which is you know part of the disaster we have in Africa. You know, Africa is going to disappear. The Africans will disappear. And we are talking about a second, if, a if, second if, outbreak of the COVID-19. Yes, pandemic. if we continue living this way, but then doctor, that, that there is yeah. no, you know, there mm. was no research that up to now. Mm. So all these numbers you hear, mm. eight thousand that have been tested, and eight thousand are also low. But even the 80,000, they are truck drivers, most of them, mm. you know, and, and the people who had come from abroad. Mm. So we need to research epidemiological surveys mm. that will guide us on how to take the next steps. The, other, the fourth area mm. is still research, to research on the virus itself and how it can be either prevented mm. from infecting people or treated. Mm. That, again, needs a very elaborate plan and funds that I haven't seen up to now. There is talk we are looking for vaccine. That's, that's uh, you know, almost idle talk because there would be institutions, structures, researchers uh, with a budget that, we, that they, they, are, they are running with. Up to now, by the way, 
we don't know where the virus in Uganda came from. You would know that by doing genome sequencing that we haven't done. Genome sequencing, understanding the nature of the, 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 the identity of the virus would also be key in determining how you manage it, you know? So research, we have not a plan and investment in it. We need then to look at how people will go back to work from lockdown. That's number five. Number five, workplaces. How have we planned the workplaces to now be workplaces under COVID? Because we departed from them when they were workplaces without COVID. Yes. How have we planned them? How do we go back into the workplaces after COVID? Mm -hmm. The only, again, you know, casual arrangements that I have seen have been maybe in the market that we will reduce people in the market. This takes elaborate planning at all levels. And everybody has to be involved. Mm -hmm. The employers have to be involved. You know, there has to be training. You know, the, so the, again, I have not seen this plan. And lastly, and most critically, how are we going to manage the social economic impact? That's it. Of COVID. That's our next conversation. <laughs> in, fact, let's, in, in fact, let's dwell into that conversation right away. Of course, we are not talking about people being infected by the virus. You're talking about people, if you're either infected or affected. You'll either get the COVID-19 or be affected by the lockdown that has been instituted to curb the spread of COVID-19. Of course, we are not talking about an impact anymore. We are trying to assess the damage, and that's why we are here, to, to, so that you help us in that regard. So help us assess the damage. What will be the likely damage after this lockdown is lifted? Well, even before the lockdown is lifted, mm. there is a huge damage that is not being focused on. Because, again, of our unpreparedness. We were not prepared for anything. You know, we did not have any food reserve, so we could not supply people that are locked down with food. Uh, we could not even provide water for them to wash their hands. We could not deal with the rental issues that I talked about, mm. you know, uh, how people survive under lockdown. Mm. Um, but more importantly, manage the ailments that are ordinarily there before COVID. Mm. So once COVID came and there was a lockdown, patients could not reach hospitals. Mm. So we have greater mobility. People who are sick, who could, cannot manage their sickness. So that has not been attended to. So we are ending, we are going to end COVID. And indeed, uh, we, we must assess how many more deaths have happened, how many more patients now we have, we, people who are on routine treatments, those treatments maybe we'll have to change because they are now, uh, they are no longer sensitive to them and so on and so forth. But getting out of, COVID, of, of, of um, lockdown, mm. one needed a plan of how do business, businesses restart, businesses that have been greatly impacted, how do they restart? The jobs, people who have lost jobs, what happens to them? Uh, you know, they, uh, and in all this, one would, would already be talking about a plan mm. of capitalization. How do we recapitalize after COVID? Mm. And in all areas, because I am sure there are plans, the, 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 the disaster of our country has been planning for exclusive groups and benefiting, you know, plans that benefit exclusive small groups. Even now, you saw, for example, when they were talking about manufacture of, 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 of masks, mm. that Nitir is already manufactured. But who, 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 who you know, they are, they are going to use that. Just to come to their defense, Nabanja did come out and say that there are 29 more companies that are going to be manufacturing face masks. Well, I was just re listening mm. to your news. Yes. They were meeting yesterday, mm. 10, 10 manufacturers mm. meeting with the, with the, the task force. Mm. How did the 10 manufacturers, even those 10 manufacturers, how did they come about? Mm. Because uh, maybe I'm here in Kasangat interested in, man in manufacturing, mm. you know, those, these things. Yes. So the question is mm. the transparency and involvement of all segments of our society. Indeed. 
and planning for them and for every citizen to see how do I, after lockdown, how do I regain my livelihood? Where do I find the capital? Where do I find the necessary tools to use in whatever I am going to do? If I am a farmer, if I am uh, a, a small um, producer of uh, whatever it is, a, a small scale uh, producer, if I, how do I uh, move? Who helps me? Who gives me the guide? This plan is totally lacking. Uh, a lot of the, what would go into that plan has to do with funding. We, we will need, you know, people's capital has been whittled mm. down. Uh, uh, Their they, they stocks have been destroyed and all kinds of mm. things. Mm. So the question is, how do we recapitalize? Indeed. This would start with major plans mm -hmm. that involve a central bank. Like? Mm. Central bank and how it supports the provision of liquidity to the lending institutions, mm. how it, it, it relaxes, how lending institutions can get funding from the central bank. Mm. There would be plans that are available to us, which would then have already translated into how lending institutions mm. would make uh, uh, credit available uh, to, 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 to uh, entrepreneurs. Mm. And, um, and to service providers, and, um, and also where there would have to be direct grants to people to, revive, to, re, to, re, to rebuild, including in the social sector. Because we are, we, are, we, are, we are heading, you know, education is going to be restarted. Education will mean that, you know, there will be supply of food, supply of inputs for education, and so on. Yes. But where is the money going to come from that is going to do that? Schools have been locked down. They, they have been fighting to pay their, their teachers mm. under lockdown. Mm. Parents are locked down. They have no income. Mm. So who is going to, how is this going to be managed? Mm. There we would need a plan. The bottom line of what I am saying is that, you know, we have not seen a plan of the opportunities that are going to be possible opportunities out there and how they can be funded and how every citizen, the idea is that every citizen should know the plan, should start, you know, at an individual level, at a a company level, at a, a community level, start seeing how they can take advantage of the new opportunities, the uh, resources available to now build a new, a, a new future. Let's focus on these individuals who have been affected. Well, the president has already said that the tourism industry will be hit the hardest, or has already been hit the hardest, by a loss of $1.6 billion. You also go to the remittances, the chair remittances, our people in the diaspora, you uh, used to remit, uh, to remit to our economy. Now we've lost $1.3 billion all the same. Now, the question is, how will the people to whom these remittances go be affected altogether? Oh, intensely. Mm. It's not, not how will they, they are already mm. affected mm. because many of our families here, because of the kind of, again, the structure of the economy here, uh, has marginalized rural people because the rural economy was destroyed. The rural economy in Uganda depended largely on, on agriculture, mm. which was organized through co the cooperative movement that would give them inputs, that would market their products, that would ensure you know, uh, skills that uh, they need and uh, extension services and so on. Mm. All that was destroyed. Mm. So the rural poverty is unbelievable. This rural poverty has been uh, cushioned mm. by people, first of all, here in towns. Mm. You know, these border border riders every day send some little money to their mothers in the villages. It has been cushioned by people working in Dubai, in Oman, where, you know, and, and far beyond. Mm. So once that is cut, it means that immediately 
this person in the village mm. has no treatment for malaria. Mm. That's how bad it is. Mm. Because, again, health care was privatized. Uh, everybody defends for themselves to get health care. Mm. So it's going to have devastating impact. Okay. And there's also talk that the opposition, uh, maybe COVID-19 hasn't been eradicated from Uganda because of the uh, opposition not doing their part. You're going to elaborate on this one because they're saying, why has the opposition not been so forthcoming in helping in the fight against COVID-19? We are not seeing the opposition on the national task force. We are not seeing the opposition giving back to the community to help, to help them alleviate the effects um, of the lockdown. Why hasn't the opposition been so forthcoming in this fight? Well, uh, really, this is uh, uh, a matter. It's not just the opposition. Mm. You see, uh, the structure of managing the pandemic ha has been extremely problematic. Mm. Any pandemic, which is a national crisis, international crisis, cannot be managed in a partisan way. Mm. Cannot be managed flimsily that you know you are like you manage uh, small problems in the country. This is a huge, huge thing. And they are playing with it, thinking that they can gain advantage out of it. But in a short time, it's going to really spill over them. And it's going to, call, it's going to, to, to become a huge problem for them. Mm. So the first thing that would have happened, which we have been talking about, is that this should never have been managed simply as a, by, under the Public Health Act that you close the economy, you close the country, even to citizens, uh, you, 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 you know, do, do all the, you impose curfew, you impose all kinds of things under the Public Health Act of 1935, the Colonial Act of 1935, mm. that, that's what you are relying on mm. to manage a pandemic of 2020, you know, a, dec a, a century later. Mm. This was disingenuous. What should have happened is that a state of emergency should have been properly declared as required under Article 110, mm. then Parliament would have created structures for the management of the pandemic. Mm. Even when they are managing it under the Public Health Act, they have not used the institutions of the Public Health Act, which talks about the sanitary committees at the district and uh, in, at the national level under the chief health, or, uh, the chief health officer. Mm. The, those are not what they are using. So they politicized this right from the beginning, and that's why they avoided to go to Parliament to have a transparent management, mm. setting up of institutions, the national task force that is set up transparently, non-partisanly, you know, uh, not just that, you, you know, this is the prime minister managing, the RDC is managing, and the RDCs can co-opt whomever they want. Mm. That's not how to manage a, a non a, 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 an emergence of this magnitude mm. and, and to manage it non-partisanly. Mm. But that, the partisanship did not stop there. You've been here, you've been seeing. You know, when they said, uh, when, pe when they locked down the country without a plan to feed them, mm. our people, everybody tried to, to help people around them. I don't know whether Zake has left hospital. The way he was clobbered, taken to uh, military detention and so on, that he was distributing food to his neighborhood. When we were seeing ministers, MOPs putting on uh, NRM mm. uniforms of yellow, distributing things on TV and nothing happening. Mm. So the partisanship in this has right from the word go mm. been the plan of Mr. Museveni. In fact, not partisanship, the personalization. Mm. Because frankly, he chose to run it as himself and issued his decrees and uh, do whatever he wants with the minister because the, the, the statutory instruments issued by the minister, by the way, the minister even amended through the statutory instruments, through the rules, amended the act under which she was acting mm -hmm. herself. Mm -hmm. There are provisions that she has, including the setting up of these structures, it amends the statute. Mm -hmm. She has no power to amend the 1935 statute, she should have gone back to Parliament to amend the statute. Mm. So the mismanagement, institutional mismanagement mm. of the pandemic mm. is entirely in the hands of Mr. Museveni and whomever he has chosen to work with.
Retired Colonel Dr. Kiza Besije talking to Morning at NTV this beautiful Wednesday where we are discussing the COVID-19 pandemic. The doctor says that uh, partisan politics has actually exacerbated the loopholes that have actually impeded the uh, fight against the spread of COVID-19 and also the fight against the effects of COVID-19. We are not only talking about people being infected, but people being affected all the same. You might not get the COVID-19 disease, but you might be affected by the uh, lockdown or the other measures that have been put in place to curtail uh, the spread of COVID-19. You're watching Morning at NTV. We are going to take a very brief break. We'll be right back with more information. We are still here in Kasangati with the retired Colonel Dr. Kiza Besije. Keep it here. You're watching Morning at NTV. And thank you for staying with us right here on Morning at NTV. My name is Romeo Basuka and we're still here in Kasangati with the retired Colonel Dr. Kiza Besije who is telling us how best this country can rebuild after the COVID-19 lockdown, how best we can live with the disease uh, before uh, a, a vaccine is actually actualized and how uh, basic can continue with this political uh, fight for change in Uganda in times like this. I'm we are talking about the COVID-19 pandemic, no campaigns, no nothing whatsoever. So doesn't that put his uh, fight for change in peril? So he'll be letting us know in that regard. I still have the uh, doctor right here with me. A very good morning once again. You actually didn't answer my question very well. You instead told me how government has made it impossible for the opposition to actually embark on community drives to help people who have been affected by the COVID-19 lockdown. But then would still want to know how why has the opposition not been so forthcoming in this fight against COVID-19, besides the government making it impossible for you? Well, the, the, but that is the, the, it's the government managing it. <laughs> so if it is making it impossible yes. for us, yes. how do we come in? Mm. But nonetheless, mm. uh, you see, uh, since the government of Mr. Museveni chose to manage it that way, it doesn't, it wouldn't stop others. Mm. The problem is, uh, has been to stop others from trying to do the little they can do. Mm. I have told you that we are doing counseling services. Mm. We also had launched a countrywide emergency service mm. to take patients to the hospital. Mm. Mm. And uh, that well, we had started with the metropolitan area here, Wakiso, Kampala, Mukono. That has continued. Mm throughout this uh, period mm. we have about a hundred cars mm. with trained drivers on how to, to manage during this kind of uh, a pandemic and they have helped many people survive mm. uh, we have tried creatively to give our own support of to support people that need food mm. and so on but doing it because again uh, we didn't want to have more victims like uh, uh, like, like Honorable Zake. Mm. So, uh, yes, we, uh, we, we have, I think, mm. within the space mm. that is available or not available, mm. we have tried to engage of to course, the extent of course, that Of course, even the possible. government gave you this opportunity to actually uh, engage the National Task Force on COVID-19. If you have any donations or any way you want to help to actually talk to the National Co uh, Task Force on COVID-19. But then the problem from the government, they're saying you haven't been so forthcoming. No, 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 no. That, for that one, we have been forth, forth, mm. forthright. We mm. have been forthcoming mm. in informing them that we are not coming. <laughs> <laughs> because, okay. because, again, we, don't, we simply don't trust the governance system. Mm. You know, the governance system, once it became... The, 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 the NRM system of governance, mm. we know what it is. Mm. We know how uh, corrupt it is. The, 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 the prime minister's office, which, uh, is the, where the, which coordinates the national task force, mm. was still under investigation for the uh, money of refugees that mm. they stole. Mm. Before that, there had been mega scandals there. Mm. You know, the, 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 the other man who is still in Rosira, the Kazindas mm. and so on. Mm. So. Uh, the RDCs and how they behave and so on. In fact, many people are still being arrested in that uh, system. So we simply cannot contribute to a system mm. that is a problem. Mm. Even on top, you know, I think you've seen the national response when 
the National Task Force asked the Ugandans to contribute 10,000 or 10k as it was popularly now <laughs> referred to. Yes. The 10k, everybody came out spitting fire on mm. them. Mm. Why? Not because people could not contribute 10,000. Mm. Ugandans are very generous. Mm. But because they cannot simply uh, see the impunity with which their money is being stolen and misused, mm. and then they, 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 contribute, mm. they contribute more mm. to it. You know, the, 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 how Parliament has been behaving with their money. Do you, do, do you, Doctor, do you think that is a double standard, uh, having them ask workers to give them uh, 10,000 shillings, yet absolutely. the same Ab workers have either been laid off or are suffering pay absolutely. cuts? Absolutely, absolutely. And also they also refuse to give them the 20% that they are looking for. So From is, is that a absolutely, double standard? Absolutely, mm. This is why I say that, you know, this whole the plan was not a plan mm. to support people. It's mm. a plan to support some other types of uh, individuals but not the population mm. you know they, if you cannot talk about a plan to support the population you can't even water here is controlled by government just mm. give them water mm. even that was a problem we spent two months trying to distribute food around Kampala only you know and the, everybody else is starving mm. so the, the the plan has never been there uh, to to care you know uh, and and the way they immediately borrowed 600 million euro to deal with the pandemic mm. and immediately sorted the way more than a half for matters that are sacred. Mm. Sacred to who? When we are in the middle of a pandemic, people are dying of hunger. Mm. Medical workers are not paid. They don't have protection equipment. You take away trillions mm. of borrowed money for pandemic mm. and you expect that people will give you their 10K. Mm. It's not possible. So that the, the governance system, if Ugandans don't you know, deal with the governance systems, we are finished. Mm. And that's why, you know, even as the pandemic has been progressing, mm. I've been communicating to Ugandans that we must now concretely develop our own plan. Which so is... that the government has its own plan. Mm. We, our own, the people's, we, we are a people's government, we are there. You know, we, so we should have our own plan <laughs> with the people on how to survive and later on how to progress, how mm. to thrive. Mm. We must have our own plan. The plans of, of what we see d b being developed are not plans that are going to save the people. Uh, I would like to get into that conversation on your plans for 2021. But then there's also this sticky issue of the truck drivers, which you've been very vo vocal on. Um, the government has now resolved to deport all these positive cases instead of handling them here. Now, is this the best way to go around this? Well, that is a regional uh, mm. cooperation mm. matter. Mm. I suspect that they would have discussed within the region. They are the same. It's, mm. it's an East African region on how to manage this because it won't affect only other countries' drivers. It will also affect our drivers. If they, are, if they test positive in Kenya, mm. I'm sure they will re send them back to Uganda mm. so that people manage their own, uh, their own uh, infected uh, uh, drivers. Mm. Uh, the, the issue of drivers it was one of the most uh, frustrating and uh, annoying things mm. that has been going on. Mm. Because, you know, all the measures that were put in place was to stop the spread, including curfew, including closing borders, including all these things. Many people have sacrificed because of that. You know, we have Ugandans stuck abroad who have no livelihood abroad, who went visiting, mm. who have no visa, who are illegally staying there, who are refused to enter Uganda. Mm. The only people allowed to enter Uganda are those cargo drivers. Mm. And so the only people allowed to move are the ones who are spreading the, 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 the COVID disease, mm. you know. Mm. Uh, at night there is a curfew except for the truck drivers who's, uh, who, who, who are the most likely drivers of the of the pandemic within the country. So of course the truck drivers are not the only problem. Right now you have taxi drivers who are saying that they cannot operate at half capacity as uh, the new measures that were given. Well by that the is president. an economic problem. Do, do you think that measure can actually halt the spread of coronavirus? No, you see there is that is a different mm. problem. Mm. There is a, a an old plan, mm. very old plan of removing as many, uh, you know, hustlers, people who hustle to survive in the city as possible, mm. you know,
to decong if you like to decongest the city of Ugandans. Uh, so people in the market, people in the you know in the tax industry, people in the border border industry, people in uh, you know informal sector in the garages. In there is a plan to push them out of the city. Mm. This plan has been there for a long, long time. Mm. Uh, and, um, and I think, again, the planners on the other side of the other government are already planning to use COVID to, to, to achieve that. Make sure that border borders are now squeezed out. Make sure that tax drivers are squeezed out. Make sure that you know, the, the market people are squeezed out. There, there is already, uh, I think, advanced plan. Mm. That's why you've had uh, Mr. Museven emphasizing mm. that after lockdown, you either have a bicycle or you, they are going to bring buses. And the bus business, again, mm. has been a controversial. And even before COVID, uh, the, the billions, I don't know, again, nearly a trillion mm. that was set aside uh, to deal with the buses to guarantee private people mm. to buy buses mm. uh, to come and do business in the city so squeeze out everybody else that is a different pro problem at 8:44, i believe we should uh, divert this conversation to your plans for 2021 we are talking about covid 19 times that have changed everything we are talking about social distancing so that makes campaigns very unlikely and we're also talking about the nrm manifesto week yes they also say that uh, they've achieved 80 percent of their manifesto implementation targets how do you plan to compete against an opponent who's achieved 80 percent of their set targets i mean this is an advantage to the ruling government and also in the era of social distancing, how will you as an opponent continue with your campaigns ahead of 2021? It is the, it is the contest mm. that we should interrogate. Say, so how do you contest against this? Mm. Let's, con let's interrogate that contest because we are now about 58 years since independence. Mm. In these 58 years, Elections have never changed the leader. Mm. 58 years, elections have never changed the leader. Mm. You think that, therefore, elections are contested? Does that what it show, is that what it shows, that elections are contested? If in 58 years of independence, they have never changed the leader? No. And that's where the problem of the country resides, not COVID. Mm. COVID is not a problem. Mm. Let me tell you what has happened since 2016. Mm -hmm. It will give you an indication of 2021. 2016, election itself has never been resolved. I declared myself a winner, for which I was charged with treason. Locked up in Moroto, brought to Ruzira, that case has never been resolved. I went to court, I told the court that it's true, I declared myself, because I know that I won. I have evidence that I won. Try the case and I give you the evidence. So these problems have already been here. It's just that COVID-19 has exacerbated yes, or yes, magnified Yes, I'm just the talking problem. about the contest. Mm. I'm just talking about the contest. Okay. So 2016, mm. in other words, I don't expect, no candidate expects that M7 commission will announce another person. That's why I announced myself, because I had evidence to allow me to announce myself. I knew I would be charged. Doctor, I, we waited for that evidence. We didn't see it. Well, give me the opportunity in a court. Actually, I published some of it on my Twitter. There is a Twitter essay. You can go back and see the summary of that evidence. I've been hearing people, you haven't shown us anything. Mm. Ugandans simply don't pay attention mm. to what is published. They mm. forget overnight mm. and think that things were not there because they have been, you know, bombarded by all kinds of propaganda. Mm. So that it, let's, but let me quickly take you through what has happened Indeed. since 2016. So 2016, election itself is still really unresolved. Mm. I contend very vehemently that Mr. Museveni has served these four years mm. illeg illegitimately. Mm. Fast forward to 2020. Yes. Now, before you get to 2020, that was 2016. Mm. 2016 itself, before the year ran out, two things happened that are very critical. In, I think it was in November, a new electoral commission is uh, appointed. Mm. 
We are still in the controversy of an election. A new electoral commission is appointed. Mm -hmm. This has been at the center of the controversy of all elections, that we have electoral commissions that are walking the stick of a, of a contestant. So Mr. Museveni, in September, appoints a new electoral commission, the Biabakama Commission. A, very, a clearly, Biabakama, you know, before that was my prosecutor. Again, for elections, he was he's the one who charged me for rape. He's the one who uh, tr he tried me for rape. He tried me for treason. He, he's the now he's the chief electoral commissioner. So we have a new electoral commission that is a problem. Appointed by somebody who is contested. So why Room 7 is still contested, he appoints a new electoral commission. Fast forward, December. Kasese, where we won by defiance. And we said that we shall win the election of, of 2016 by defiance. In Kasese, we won every seat by defiance. In December, it is attacked. The palace of the king is destroyed and other institutions. Many people are still in prison from Kasese. Not tried. There has never been a trial. The king is still in prison here of Kasese. Many people killed and buried in mass, mass graves. That was election violence. December 2016. We come to 2017. 2017 starts now the attack on the constitution. That's when parliament was attacked. 2017. Parliament is attacked in broad daylight by people from the president's office under camera. During the eight yes, yes. September, parliament is attacked. The Speaker Kadaga put it in writing, demanding to know who attacked Parliament. People were injured. Honorable Bonambos still has metals and is still, you know, limping on, on a stick. Attacked by people that are not known, but people who came from the President's office. You heard recently Honorable Kadaga saying Parliament is under attack. Parliament was destroyed a long time ago. It's not just being attacked and now we're under COVID. So with the parliament so, that is under attack, so you, democratic institutions that are crumbling, how are you going to be able so, to so, compete? So first? Let, let me let mm. me just so parliament is attacked, the constitution is amended in December under that attack. So how do you plan to compete against Let's that? go to 2018. 2018 starts with the uh, we see uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, that was when uh, the, the Bank of Uganda brought money. Was that 2018? No, no, no. 2018, there was uh, two things that happened. Arua election. By election. That saw, again, extreme violence on opposition. That's when the Honorable Chagulanyis were... Uh, and the driver got in trouble. Yes, he mm. killed and so on. And that is still going on. But under that same year... Another interesting thing happens. We now get a, a Chinese convicted in, in, in America. Chi Ping, Chi Ping Ho mm. is convicted in America for bribing mm. African leaders, mm. among whom were Ugandans. Mm. Up to now, Kutesa, the Minister of Finance mm. of, of Foreign Affairs, mm. has never gone to, to the U.S. Mm. because of that case. We have a, a, a minister of foreign affairs that can't even <laughs> go to the U.S. But among those, in his defense, mm. you know, they said that the money he brought had been requested as money to support the election. So money to support the election. In other words, and this is criminal, you know. So half a million dollars that was brought to support the election by Chinese mm. who were looking for oil. Mm. That is 2018. 2019, Bank of Uganda, the money, the crates from Bank of Uganda, crates that were coming printed, the scandal erupts of Bank of Uganda. Mm. 2019, recruitment of LDUs. The LDUs are already rampaging. I think you have seen what LDUs have been doing. Mm. Recruited 2018. Before every election, militias are recruited. The other time it was crime preventers. The other time it was SSPCs. Mm. Now the LDUs are already doing their job. They are the crime preventers so in different units. So you cannot have an election mm. when three things are not there. One. Institutions. Mm -hmm. We have totally captive 
institutions. Mm -hmm. Institutions are captured. Parliament mm -hmm. captured. Courts. I didn't talk about courts, but courts, you know, have been attacked by black members mm -hmm. captured. Mm -hmm. Or a hundred percent of judges mm -hmm. appointed by Mr. Museven mm -hmm. in the last uh, uh, time. Mm -hmm. So we have no courts. We have no parliament. We have no electoral commission. We have no Bank of Uganda. The, this, uh, n n n now, so th that is the institution. Second, human rights. Human rights is the second. Human rights, you, you, anybody who is on the opposition is targeted for human rights abuses. Mm -hmm. General Tumukundi, who just, who has been a, a fanatic of, of, of the NRM, the moment he said, by the way, I also think it's time for me to contest, he has just come back from Luzira. His office, his office completely attacked. Mm -hmm. So, we, we, you cannot have elections without human rights, without uh, uh, institutions, without mm. free citizens, free and active citizens. Mm. We must have free and active citizens. Mm. And the freedom of citizens includes their survivability, how, whether citizens can survive. If citizens are hungry, if citizens have no uh, access to mm. basic needs, those citizens are not free. And therefore, mm. elections in Uganda should not take place under such circumstances. Mm. Our view, our position is, mm. our position is mm. that we should only have elections once we have resolved this. Mm. So, COVID now has come. COVID has intensified all the three has intensified the problem of the, of the institutions. I have told you that COVID is managed by M7 alone. Two, it has intensified the problem of human rights mm. with all the terror that has been going on under COVID. Three, it has intensified the weakness of citizens. Amazing insights from the retired Colonel Dr. Kiza Besija, who has been telling us how best we can survive this era of COVID-19, how we can actually uh, live with the, vir with the disease, which is COVID-19, even though we haven't gotten a vaccine, and how, and how best he can navigate the challenges that he has experienced and still affect change in Uganda. Well, I do have him here. He's going to maybe wrap up this uh, conversation with a shout out to some of our people who are celebrating their birthdays on this particular particular day uh, the doctor is going to be reading out your names and wishing you a happy birthday in that regard so if you are there watching right now and it's your birthday get it from me a happy birthday to you and everyone the kings the queens the young ones who are celebrating their birthdays on this particular Wednesday but then let's hear it from the colonel himself uh, help us read some of the messages from our dear viewers who are watching right there yeah thank you very much I, I mm. didn't quite cap the, the election <laughs> thing the, what we need to yeah. do since COVID is mm. here and we can't, frankly, yeah. you know, have freedom. Mm. I think we should let the time of Mr. Museveni end mm. if we are not yet, you know, if we haven't had change, mm. have a transition mm. that can do the three things that I talked about. Mm. We should not extend, certainly the extension of the term mm. must be completely out of our Which mind. is highly unlikely. Yes, then... I'm very, very glad to mm. be... Uh, you know, uh, having this wonderful morning to be happy with those who are celebrating. Mm. Arima Zlatan Ja Roots, uh, you are indeed a lucky one today. Happy birthday to you, and uh, God bless you, Arima. Mile uh, Nancha Basilica, happiest birthday to you and uh, to Alice, uh, Alice Mukulu. Omugole, happy, happy birthday. Uh, we have Jacqueline Namusanga. Uh, and Jacqueline Namusanga says, Angera, I wish all the best on your uh, birthday. Uh, love from Anna. Ima and all of us love you, darling. Uh, Maybe we, one last one. We have, uh, uh, I think uh, uh, that was the last one. Mm. It seems there is... Uh, oh, there is Grace to Kwasibwe, mm. who also today is my birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday, birthday, Grace. There is Kikule Kasalia Kizito. Kasalia Kizito, uh, 
Kusanyuki Deko Munange, happy birthday to you. Okay. And all those who are enjoying uh, or celebrating a birthday under lockdown. I had mine mm. last month under lockdown. It's not, it's not <laughs> such a great fun. But I wish you all the best on yes, this and uh, happy birthday, birthday of yours. doctor. Thank you. <laughs> amazing, amazing insights from the retired Colonel Dr. Kiza Besje. I did enjoy myself from all the way that uh, we started. That is uh, 7, yes, we started around 7 a.m. all the way up to 9 a.m. My name is Romeo Busiku. The doctor has been sharing with us his insights on COVID-19. How can we survive after the lockdown? How can we live with the COVID-19 disease? before we actually get a virus and what were his plans as far as 2021 is concerned in uh, as far as 2021 is concerned and the virus that we are grappling with which is covid 19. my name is Romy busiku let's do this again tomorrow same time coming up is moa suzemutia with farida nakaziwe have yourselves a blessed day good morning